we'll go ahead and um, go to questions here in Houston if you have no opening statement, and we'll start with uh, Mark Caro, the Houston Chronicle. Uh, good morning. My question is for Dr. Sacco. You spoke uh, before the mission with some enthusiasm about the opportunity to leave academia to uh, pursue some research in space, including your experiment with zeolites. I just wonder how you assess that experience now. Was it worth the training, uh, the launch delays? Has the mission been long enough for your work? And you might just comment on your zeolite experiment. Do you think it's benefited? Stand by for uh, Marshall PAO. TV here in Huntsville. My question is for Dr. Leslie. Doctor, my question is to get you to please comment on the role that Marshall has played in this mission. We know that the folks here in Huntsville have overseen a lot of the experiments there. Comment on the support that you have received from the crews here on the ground at Marshall? Well, the support from Marshall has, has been uh, quite extensive. As, as you know, a number of experiments came from Marshall, so that's a contribution from the science side. We did a lot of our training there at Marshall. There's a simulator of uh, this laboratory module there. So we sent, spent uh, a year and a half training there, and of course, during the flight itself, the uh, Payload Operations Control Center is provided a tremendous amount of support in replanning our activities and keeping the uh, science going. So uh, Marshall's made a tremendous contribution to this flight. This is Martin Berkey with the Huntsville Times. Uh, Dr. Leslie, if you could uh, tell me what the benefit is of uh, having gotten a chance to go up yourself and do your science instead of simply sending uh, someone up that's not as familiar with it as you? Well, I wish I had the luxury to spend all my time on, on my experiment and watching the, uh, the flows being generated. Unfortunately, I've got other duties here, so I, I don't have that luxury. But um, the ones I've seen look really great. As you know, we were trying to look for transitions and certain types of flows that occur on a rotating sphere. And I've seen those. I know there's a lot of data that's gone down. In fact, the instrument is uh, running now as I look over at it. So even as we speak, there's data coming down. I'm going to look forward to spending the next year or so going over that data with the co-investigators, and we'll have a great look at it. Uh, Martin Burke again. Uh, even Al Pennington at one point said that he thought this mission might uh, be sort of like watching grass grow, and that's okay. But uh, I was wondering what you would tell your folks and friends in Huntsville about the importance of... Uh, doing this basic science that's hard to illustrate to them personally. Well, I'm sure uh, farmers might be excited about watching grass grow, and scientists are excited about watching science experiments take place. So I, maybe I'm an optimist, but I think the number of experiments we've been doing here for the past two weeks are going to really make a difference. So I'm excited about it. And uh, finally, uh, Dr. Leslie, if you could uh, tell, talk a little bit, if you would, uh, for Huntsville people about more specifically what it was like, I mean, when you first reached orbit, 
that very first moment that you, you know, began to experience uh, space? Well, I guess my first experience, um, of course, going uphill just before the main engines cut off, we were around 3 Gs, and we were feeling that, lying on our backs, we were feeling that through our chest. But as soon as we hit Miko, that is the main engine cut off, um, suddenly things turned around, and I thought down was no longer where my back was, but it was wherever I put my feet. So for the next uh, day or so, it took a little getting used to uh, the slight disorientation, but uh, you adapt after, I guess it's different for in individuals, but took me about a day or so to uh, to adapt to that, and uh, it feels great now. This is Marcia Dunn of the Associated Press for anyone who'd like to answer. Earlier in the mission, some of you mentioned missing pizza and showers. What else are you looking forward to getting back to? And realistically speaking, how much more time do you wish you had up there? Yeah, well, the pizza and the showers are definitely going to be a welcome when we get back. But in addition to that, I guess a lot of us are missing our families. I've got a two-and-a-half-year-old daughter, and I'm uh, real excited about getting to see her and hold her again after two weeks. But the uh, mission has been fantastic. And as a matter of fact, the, uh, I know personally I'm hoping for at least one wave off day so we get to spend a little extra time up here. This is Vicki Vaughn with Reuters. I have a question for Katie and for Michael. Um, do you feel uh, as if you had enough free time? I know there were there is free time built into everyone's schedule, but do you each of you feel that it was enough? Did you have enough time just to do uh, just to look out the window and do the things that you wanted to do? Well, as you might know, we've each had uh, two half days off during this 16-day uh, mission, and those have been uh, really great. As much as I enjoy working on the science, and, and I really do enjoy that every day. I mean, you come into work, and you, know, you gather all your stuff together before you go to the lab and come into the lab and, and start doing really interesting things. It's fascinating to watch, and usually they have to make us go to lunch because we don't want to stop. But then uh, I'll go back to the flight deck and look out the window, and it, it really is a special, special vantage point to be able to look out at the Earth this way. And I find that uh, you just have to take your breaks and uh, go look out the window. I feel like I've done that um, probably never enough. I, I've tried to do it as much as I can, but I don't think uh, there is any such thing as enough. So that's a hard question to answer. Uh, my situation was a little bit different. As uh, one of the orbiter crew members, I was not tasked uh, on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, as was the payload crew. So uh, my duties consisted mostly in the flight deck, and uh, I got a great chance to look out the window. Um, the pace for me was very comfortable, and I certainly got enough time off. Uh, toward the end of the flight, after I started to be a little bit more efficient about how I did things, I, be I found that I had more time than uh, I had in the beginning of the flight, and I was actually looking for other things to do to help my uh, crewmates. But you never get tired of the view, and it's a great way to spend your free time. Uh, it's Bill Harwood, CBS News for Dr. Thornton. Uh, it seems like every time there's a space lab mission like this, reporters always ask you guys to talk about how it mirrors space station operations and things like that. I guess I've been struck during this flight by the role of telescience, uh, by the multi-user facilities that are on board. Uh, could you talk about that theme uh, in the sense philosophically this sort of flight really does, I think, mirror some of the operations on space station? Can you give me your thoughts on that? Well, the number of experiments on board that are precursors to space station experiments, uh, the drop physics module, the surface tension experiments that we're doing are precursors. Some of the crystal growth experiments will be done on space station. And what we learn on these short duration flights can help in the development of those facilities for longer term use on the space station. Some of the things that we've had on board this flight that are new are ground air television and um, uh, the, the uh, electronic data transfer we've had up and down is not new on this flight, but it's relatively new in the program. And also the, uh, the digital television, where we send down six uh, channels of digital video over one uh, high data rate KU channel is new on this flight. And I think that's the way sta station, sta space station is going to be. We have a lot of data to get to the ground, and we're going to have to do it in this way. So this is kind of a pathfinder for uh, the kind of operations we're going to have on the space station. This is Michael Cabbage with Florida Today, and my question is for Kathy Thornton and Al Sacco. 
I know the people at Marshall are still in the early stages of reviewing the data for most of the experiments, but have there been any results that jump out as something totally unexpected or anything you'd characterize as a major discovery at this point? Well, anytime you, we do science uh, hands-on like we're doing it here, uh, there's some surprises. We have seen some pr surprises in terms of the crystal growth. Uh, in particular, what I've seen is some of the crystals have grown faster than I expected them to grow based on uh, previous literature I had read. Uh, in other cases, uh, crystals that I expected to grow slower uh, did grow slower. I'm trying to analyze exactly what that is, whether it has to do with the fluid dynamics or whether we had changed something. saw some interesting things uh, that Kathy will talk about in a minute on the combustion experiments. Uh, we were looking at flames burn as well. So, yeah, we've learned an awful lot, and that's what science is all about. Uh, things change. You postulate something. You find out just how good you really understand things, and then you move the, the situation forward in an iterative process. And that's exactly what's working out here. Uh, there's been some significant surprises in terms of the rates, uh, in my mind anyways, as a crystal grower, and we'll be evaluating those. A lot of our fluids experiments cannot be done on the ground, so everything up here was pretty much a surprise. We found that a lot of times the procedures that we had from pre-flight are essentially being rewritten after the first one or two runs of an experiment because of the things that were learned in those first one or two runs. And I think it's great that we can be flexible enough to handle that, that uh, all the folks on the ground can turn things around that fast, and particularly in the drop physics module and the surface tension driven convection experiment. We saw a lot of new things that were not expected. P. Call Terry with the West Kentucky News uh, for the commander. Uh, by the way, thanks for waiting till I got back from vacation for lifting off. Uh, if everything goes according to schedule, uh, uh, you'll be coming uh, home Sunday, and uh, apparently the range is not going to be able to fully support you. What have you been uh, doing to prepare for uh, the landing? Well, we've been doing our standard uh, protocol exercise, trying to take care of ourselves, getting plenty of sleep. And we've also been using the pilot uh, simulator, a small, uh, it's a workstation and a laptop computer that allows us to practice our landings on orbit, take a look at our symbology, the landing HUD symbology, before we actually get into the landing pattern. And uh, we're looking forward to the landing. This is Marcia Dunn of the Associated Press again for anyone. If you were going to spend another month or two or three in orbit, like on a space station, I'm wondering what kind of amenities would you like to make your life more livable? And maybe along those lines, the ground to air TV helped in terms of your family contacts. Um, could you talk about livable living in space? Well, I think the. Uh we love our food up here, but what I've learned on this slide is I didn't spend enough time in my menu and I repeated too many items. So variety on food, I think, is very important. Even things you think you're not going to like, after eating the same thing several days in a row, you're ready for a change. The, uh, as far as other things, it's very important to have a little bit of privacy, and uh, we've seen that with our sleep stations on board. Not all flights have them, but that's very important. And I think for station, and when you start spending two or three or four months in space, You've got to give people some privacy just so uh, they can have a little bit of time alone, and that'll make it much more productive and efi efficient in the long run. I'll add to that. Uh, one thing that would be quite a bit different is uh, we've been working pretty hard for uh, two weeks. This is kind of a sprint compared to a two-month or three-month or four-month stint on orbit. And so I think things would be a little bit different rather than have every uh, minute planned out to the, to the detail. Uh, we would probably have some uh, more general goals to accomplish in a day or even a week. And we would probably not be working uh, 12 hours a day either because that could be, uh, that'd be pretty tough to maintain over that time. So the question becomes, well, what are you going to do in your free time? And um, I guess you need to come up with some sort of uh, entertainment. And you mentioned ground air TV. That would be one thing. Uh, certainly a, a selection, a greater selection of music, and I personally would wish I would have uh, brought a book along to read because um, sometimes it takes a little while to unwind after the day is over, and uh, when you get into into uh, the sleep station uh, without anything to read, you kind of have to let your mind wander a little bit, and uh, it's a little bit tougher that way, and I think I could have learned something and enjoyed myself at the same time.
This is Vicki Vaughn with Reuters again. Um, I have a follow-up to Marcia's question. Um, Michael, I'd like to know what kind of music you did listen to or what was available up there. Um, but my question is, if um, I'm hoping maybe um, two of you could answer this. If you were suddenly put in charge of a uh, new mission, USML-3, what changes would you like to make, either in terms of scheduling or the science aboard, anything, uh, maybe any broad issue that you would uh, like to address or change on an upcoming mission? Vicki, that was a long question. Let me see if I, uh, the beginning of it, I think you asked what kind of music uh, or what selection we have. Actually, each of us got to bring a selection of music with us, and uh, I'm not sure, but I don't think we've done any exchanging yet, but that, that certainly is an option. Um, as far as uh, what other changes we've, what other changes we might entertain, well, I think we mentioned a few of them. Um, as I said, I'd like to bring along a book. Uh, I don't think we have any complaints with the scheduling whatsoever. For the length of mission that we have, it was not too much work, yet it was enough. And uh, I think we really got a lot of bang for our buck with the science teams. So I, I think uh, that's, that's something that I would not change. Now, as I said, if we were going to stay up here a bit longer, we might slack off a little because it, this is a pretty um, a sprint type pace that would be tough to maintain over a much longer period. And uh, I'll let uh, Katie answer. Well, if I was going to have anything to do with USML3, it would be longer. Because uh, once we got up here to do some of the experiments that we've been practicing and, and uh, talking about and planning and, and trying to figure out exactly what is the best way to do them up here on orbit, and when you actually get to do them, it's, it's just a wonderful thing. I just feel like I'm, I'm up here doing what I came to do, and, and that's great for me. So it would be a longer mission, uh, certainly. And uh, I guess... Uh, We'd probably do a lot more exchanging on music. I brought, um, I don't know, a country singer named Teresa, uh, Pat Benatar, and Mary Tape and Carpenter. Hello, it's CBS for uh, Commander Bowersox. Uh, I guess the weather forecast isn't all that optimistic for Sunday landing here. If you land Monday, you'll break the uh, shuttle record for a long-duration flight. Uh, can you just, two things, can you discuss, A, your readiness to land uh, after this long of a flight, uh, you know, how you stay in shape? I realize you, you, you exercise and use pilot, uh, but just your general views on landing after a long flight. And, and broader than that, what is the state of knowledge now about how long you think a, a pilot to the shuttle can stay weightless um, and still perform properly when you pull G's coming back down? kind of a follow-up of an earlier question. Um, on all prior shuttle landings, NASA has gotten C-band radar tracking support from the Air Force's Eastern Range. But because of a Titan launch schedule for Saturday night at the air station, this will be the first landing not to have that data available. Does that create any additional concerns for you?
backup mode that's always been available. We're going to be using the TAC hands and, uh, and an alternate method of tracking. Um, we've looked into it, and we think it's a reasonable thing to do. Of course, uh, at NASA, we always like to do things the best way we possibly can, uh, and uh, that's the C-band beacons when, when they're available. Uh, but when we have to go to a fallback, we go to a fallback, we try to be flexible, and that's what we're doing in this situation, just trying to be flexible with our operations. And I think what we're doing is very reasonable. P. Call Terry with the West Kentucky News for KT. Um, this mission seems to be going real smooth as far as the science is concerned. Um, in fact, I kind of liken it to uh, it's like the Apollo 17 of shuttle missions. Um, can you uh, comment on uh, how sophisticated you think this is, uh, this mission's been? Could you repeat the last part of that question? I don't think any of us picked it up. Yeah. Uh, can you comment on how uh, how sophisticated you think this mission is in the way of being a complex science mission? I think a lot of our experiments are very complex, and I personally was surprised that things have gone as smoothly as they have. Usually if things go wrong, they, they will. At least something will go wrong with the number of experiments we have on board. And we built a lot of contingency time into our timeline to take care of that. Well, we haven't used any of that for contingency, so we've been able to collect a lot of data, I think, that we weren't expected to get. So uh, there are very complex experiments on board, but they're working beautifully. Bill Harwood, CBS, for Catherine Coleman. Uh, training for a space lab mission, of course, is a, is a real sprint for a couple of years. You guys work around the clock, and then you finally get up on the mission, and you work in dual shifts to, to do all this. Do you, do you have a chance at all, or have you had a chance yet to reflect upon this and to, to think about expectations versus reality, and, uh, and, and your general thoughts on uh, how it lived up to your expectations? Well, I'll tell you that I was, uh, I was just uh, so surprised uh, when, well, not surprised that we launched, but surprised on launch that uh, how excited I was, and that I'd looked forward to this for years and years, and I just can't tell you how exciting it was and just how thrilled, and, and that just lasted for, for days and days, and every time I go and look out the window, it, it comes back, and every time I push off and float across the module, it comes back. Um, it's, it's very seldom that something actually surpasses your expectations, especially when you have very big ones, but this flight really has, and I'm not ready to come home yet. This is Michael Cabbage with Florida Today, and this question is for anyone. Debbie Brown in the Aerospace Education Office at JSC said the idea for holding the interactive sessions with high school students first was suggested by crew members. And my question is, who initially came up with this idea, and do you think this is a worthwhile teaching method that should be repeated on future shuttle flights and on space stations? And I handed this to me because uh, I'm the academician, I guess, in the group. But really what happened is we were sitting around having a, a pizza one night, and uh, we're talking about how we all got here. And in the course of the conversation, decided that uh, science isn't really for gleeps, which is uh, a general perception about young people today. And we thought we'd bring that home because some young people look up to the astronaut corps. We'd bring it home by bringing some of the science we're really doing, which is world-class science, and have some of the kids do very similar things and interact with them. So it was really an idea that was bred from all of us, and uh, Kathy Thornton went forward with it and pushed it, and uh, we were able to get it on board. And I, as an academician and an educator, hope we'll do it in the future. I hope the kids benefited from it. I certainly did, and I think uh, it's very important in this country we keep these kids excited about math and science because that is uh, what will bring this country uh, as a leader into the 21st century, and we all have to keep that in mind all the time. But it was really great. And we had a lot of fun, and I just hope the kids did as well. Okay, you have said you had two dreams, one to be a teacher and one to, to fly in space. Now you've done both. Do you have a third dream? Yeah, I've fulfilled uh, two of my dreams. I have a lot more, not the least of which is to grow some of the largest, more uh, perfect zeolites that have ever been grown. Hope to do that on this flight. But I have a lot of things ahead of me uh, as an individual. I have a lot of development to do. I need to uh, talk to a lot of kids, which I hope to do, and uh, to get them excited about math and science. And uh, their future is out here. As I look into the cosmos and see what's around, 
I realize that uh, the universe is really our playground, and we need to take advantage of it. We need to get our kids excited about it moving forward. So that's one of the things that I've, one of the messages that I'm going to be coming home with. Okay, um, Commander, how is Al Ben as a, a companion in space? Well, I, I can't imagine a, a better payload crew member to have on board than Al. Uh, of course, Fred is equal. They're both really good guys. Uh, but Al brings a certain fire to the crew, a certain spirit. Uh, he's a lot of fun. He's always joking around. And his wife makes great spaghetti. Okay, uh, Al, any chance the flight will be extended at all for a couple of days? Geez, I don't know. I'm keeping my fingers crossed, my legs crossed, my eyes crossed, and everything else I can cross. So that will... That will happen, but right now uh, we're planning on a normal, nominal landing, uh, and if we have some bad weather, maybe we'll get an extra day or so. We're all open for that because we all feel great. None of us are tired. We worked hard, but we have a lot of things. We've accomplished a lot of things, and we'd like to just keep it going. About the training you received getting up there, is it, was the training exactly what it is like up there in space, or have you been caught by surprise at all? Now, actually, the training uh, was surprisingly good. It, it really was excellent. Uh, they told us exactly what to expect. Uh, sometimes we come up here, and I was uh, not expecting some things that they thought we were going to expect because I just felt that that probably wouldn't happen. And sure, you know, experience always wins out. And a lot of these folks have experience. That's what they learn from other crews. And so what you have is... Uh, training that really is specific for what you're doing, and it's very, very good, and I haven't had any surprises in terms of uh, operationally. I know Commander uh, Ken Bowersox is uh, with us as well on the line, and uh, uh, Ken, uh, is the, is Al pulling his load there on board the shuttle? Oh, yeah, Al's pulling his load. He's, uh, he's doing a great job. He's keeping us all laughing. Uh, his wife provided us with some great dehydrated spaghetti that she made at home, and uh, he's been doing an outstanding job on the science. And uh, one of the neatest things he's added to this fight is his excitement about the science that we're doing. Uh, Al just beams up when he's got something uh, going on in the glove box or on the DPM module or SCDC, any of the units he's working on. And uh, that spirit rubs off on the rest of us and makes us excited about the science, too. And, Ken, I know you've got over 500 hours in space. Uh, does it ever get routine, or is it exciting every time you go up? Well, it may be a routine for some people, but it's not for me. I love it every time I come up. The Earth is just as beautiful uh, on this my third flight as it was on my first flight, and I'm looking forward to seeing it some more. How do you sleep? Are you tied in, or do you just pretty much find an open corner? No, no, we have uh, little sleeping bunks. Uh, they look like uh, kitchen cabinets. You sort of open a door and crawl in, and uh, they're very comfortable. They they have liners in them, and you just it's sort of the ultimate waterbed. You know, you just float there, and uh, I happen to listen to music all night, or at least not all night, for, for an hour or so before I go to sleep. Sometimes do some reading and then uh, drift off to sleep. It's very comfortable. What about any uh, motion sickness, uh, stomach problems? How have you been faring as far as your health goes? Yeah, I was surprised. I got up here and expected, expected to have uh, maybe a little bit of an upset stomach, and I feel so well the first few days. And I had a couple of uh, periods where I felt like I was not going to feel good, but I just took the advice of my commander, which was to slow down and to concentrate and just relax a little bit, and it went right away. And I didn't uh, get sick the whole time I was up here. In fact, none of us did. 